Well, we're going to make a transition uh, this week and to next week, and next week we're going to be in the New Testament, and we're going to be studying. Um, we're going to be studying next week John the Baptist telling of Christ coming, and so this week uh, Anna has chosen Joseph. Now for the children, which is a great lead-in to Christ, because there are so many great stories that Joseph has. His, his life is the longest, it's the longest running narrative about any single person in the whole Old Testament, okay? David may get just a few more words in, in Psalms or in his story, but as far as this telling of a narrative, Joseph gets the most pages, the most press for it. But what I wanted to do this morning was not necessarily make all the points or tell you uh, all of the story. We're going to be rushing through his life really quick, and you could, you could spend weeks on the story of Joseph. You could even preach an hour sermon on Joseph, if you remember me doing that uh, my like second year uh, here. People just got up and walked out. <laughs> Seriously, we had one elderly gentleman get up and, and walk out because he said his roast was burning at home. <laughs> so I try not to keep you for a full hour in the sermon this morning. But what I really want to do is I, I want to show you all the parallels, all the parallels that there are between Joseph's life and Jesus' life. And as we go through, I just want to give you some words of encouragement. Sound good? I don't care if it doesn't sound good to you, you're going to get it anyway. All right. The tumultuous family. So a lot of people want to start um, Joseph's story in Genesis 37, but it really starts back at the bottom of chapter 30, or excuse me, the bottom of 29, the end of 29. So if you have a Bible and you want to kind of follow along, uh, you can, and your handout also has uh, some of the notes, and it also has some of the key verses that we'll be going through. But what you need to understand about Joseph, you have to understand his father and the family that he comes from. Now, Jacob Jacob is a con artist and a manipulator, and he has four wives. And as you can imagine, a family that has four wives can be trouble. Now, he was married to Leah, but who is his real love? Rachel. He really loved Rachel. And he showed Rachel all the affection. And then Rachel, uh, excuse me, Leah gets jealous about Rachel because Jacob is spending all his time with her. So when the oldest is born, when Reuben is born, Leah named him Reuben. For she said, the Lord has noticed my misery and how my husband, and now my husband will love me. Do you get that? Now that I've had a boy and Rachel doesn't have a boy, hasn't given him a boy, he'll love me best. Rachel became jealous of her having a son and said, sleep with Billah, my servant. And she became pregnant and presented him a son. Rachel named him Dan, for she said, God has vindicated me. And he has heard my request and given me a son. Then Billah became pregnant again and gave Jacob a second son. Rachel named him Naphtali. Guess what Naphtali means? I have struggled with my sister and now I'm winning. Does that sound like a messed up family? Well, if that doesn't, try this on. Reuben, the oldest, sleeps with his father's maidservant, Billah, trying to secure his position of dominant male in the family. Now, I, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty messed up family. Have you ever been there? Did you grow up in a blended family where gossip and rumors and doubts dominated the relationship? I want you to be encouraged. Joseph grew up in that setting, and Jesus grew up in a blended family. Next, we have Joseph's coat and his dreams. 
Chapter 37 tells us Joseph was favored by his father, Jacob. He was his favorite. He, he was the firstborn child from his true love, which was Rachel, and he favored him, and he made him a coat to signify that he was to rise to the top. He was going to be the administrator over the family. Now, he did this by, by giving him a coat. Now, your translation says, um, probably says, that it was a coat of what? Many colors. But the real Hebrew word is pass, P-A-S, pass. And guess what? We really don't know what it means. But we've made some guesses. Some of the translators say that it was a coat of many colors. Others say it was a full-length coat, meaning it went all the way down to his sleeve. You've heard the phrase, Pat, roll up your sleeves and get to work, right? Well, in their day, the common man's sleeve on their coat only went to their elbow because they did a lot of manual labor. So Jacob's coat may not have just been ornate. It may also have been long, signifying that he wasn't going to do manual labor. And this made his brothers very jealous. Joseph was chosen by Jacob as his favorite son. And Jesus was God's chosen son who came and took on our sins so that you and I might be sons and daughters of inheritance. And then, then Joseph tells of, this, of these dreams that he has. And in these dreams... Everything is bowing down to him. And this signifies that his family someday is going to bow down to him. It caused his brothers to hate him even more. Scripture says his brothers wanted to kill him for it. Joseph was hated by his own brothers for his words. But then again, Jesus came to his own and they did not receive him. They did not know him. His own people vowed to kill him for his words. And let me encourage you this morning. Jesus says you're going to be persecuted for his words also. You live like Christ. You talk like Christ. You share the love of God with others. And you're going to be persecuted. But remember what he said on the Sermon of the Mount. You'll be blessed. If you receive persecution on my part, you're going to receive a blessing for it. Well, we move through the story, and Joseph is betrayed and sold. While Joseph was going to go see about his brothers to give daddy a report, he gets to Shechem, and they're not in Shechem where they're supposed to be. They're in Dotham. And so he goes to Dotham, and as he's walking over the side of the hill, the brothers see him from afar, and they say to themselves, let's kill him. And so they take him, and they throw him in a cistern, which is just a deep dugout hole where you keep water. But there wasn't any water in it. It was dry at the time. And while they're trying to figure out what they're going to do with this coat and the scheme that they're going to tell their dad about why Joseph's not coming home, some Ishmaelites who are come up out of the land of Midian, who are ultimately on their way to Egypt, are going past. And the brothers say, why, why have the blood of murder on our hands? We'll just sell him off into slavery. We'll sell him out. And for 20 pieces of silver, they sell Joseph into slavery. Ultimately, he ends up at Potiphar's house in Egypt. But as you know, Jesus' community plotted to kill him also. And they sold him out. One of his inner circle, Judas, sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. And if you're here today and you feel like you've been sold out by someone close to you, don't feel foolish. Don't feel naive. Don't, don't be surprised. And don't worry that you've done anything wrong because this is the human condition, church. Hurt people hurt people. 
And that cycle of hurt is just going to go over and over again. My two older daughters who work in counseling keep telling me about the cycles of domestic violence and how the cycles just repeat themselves, Alex, until the love of God is injected into a family and that stops the cycle of hurting. It goes on and on. Hurt people hurt people. Don't let others' imperfections and shortcomings, though, limit your potential. Joseph didn't. Jesus certainly didn't. Go on with life. Be who God has called you to be. Excel to the potential that God has prepared for you, just like Joseph, just like Jesus. Well, the next scene has the rise and fall of Joseph in Potiphar's house. In Potiphar's house, Joseph rises to the top. He's a man with integrity. God blesses everything he does to the point that, that Potiphar, just, Potiphar just says, hey, you run the household. I can see that the, the gods are blessing you and you're a man with integrity. You just run the household. And it, Scripture says he didn't have anything to worry about except for what he was going to order from Grubhub at night. Not really, but it does say the only thing that Potiphar worried about for himself, the only decision he had to make at the household, was what he was going to dine for dinner. And everything looks great. David, it couldn't be going any better until he, until he catches the eye of Potiphar's wife. Now, Scripture says that Joseph was ripped and handsome. Now, maybe your translation says well-formed. Maybe it said he, he, was, he was of a good figure, a.k.a. translated into today's term, he was ripped and handsome. And he caught the eye of Potiphar's wife, and she begs him to sleep with her. Now, he's young. He's upward mobile. He's, he's, he's taking on new things, but he's still God's man. He still remembers who he is. And he tells her, how could I do this thing? Your husband, Potiphar, has given me everything except you, and, and you expect me to sleep with you? And how could I do the sin against God? Because ultimately, all sin is against God, right? He denies her. He runs, stays, avoids her. It appears in Scripture that this goes on day after day, and he's trying to avoid her until one day, he goes into the house to do some of his administrative work, and while he's there, she sneaks in, and Jack, she grabs hold of his cloak, and she says, sleep with me. And he does what we all ought to do when Satan's got us by the collar. He bolts away. He puts himself in a different environment to keep from sinning. Well, Woman scorned, you know how that goes. She screams out, tells the servants he tried to rape me. Potiphar comes home, he's got the coat. Potiphar's angry, throws Joseph into prison. Charles and I were talking about this over coffee on Thursday, and we both agreed that the reason that Joseph probably didn't lose his life right there, the reason he probably wasn't killed on the spot, because it was nothing for Egyptians to kill other people of other ethnicities, okay? Read about Abraham and why he said his, his wife was his sister, okay? The reason he didn't is he probably knew his wife's character, and he was probably put Joseph in prison because that was a way of not killing someone he cared about and saving face with the rest of the community.
two things I want you to think about here. Both Jesus and Joseph were tempted and resisted. Both refused on account of their love for God. Joseph in Potiphar's house, Jesus in the wilderness, and both Jesus and Joseph were falsely accused and arrested. Both had their reputations falsely called into question, and both were falsely imprisoned. Maybe this is where you find yourself this morning, falsely accused of something that you didn't do, or almost as bad and almost as painful. Maybe someone has taken your words and twisted them. Maybe you were misunderstood. Maybe you didn't use the best words to communicate how you really how you really felt about something. And someone took your words wrongly and twisted them into something hurtful that you never meant. Let me encourage you. Don't let false claims and accusations hurt you. Let them roll off of you like water off a, wing, a duck's wing. Joseph nor Jesus let temptations nor false accusations interfere with their integrity. Both of them continued in patience and in compassion towards other people, which leads us to our next scene, Joseph in the prison, Genesis 39 and 40. Because of God's steadfast love, his hesed, and Joseph's integrity, Joseph rises to the top even in prison. Scripture says, this is Genesis 39, if you're following along, Genesis 39, starting at verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because God was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Then in chapter 40, two new guys come to prison. One is the cupbearer. Now, if you're wondering what a cupbearer is, he's the guy with the privilege to taste the king's food before the king tastes it, so if it's poisonous, he'll drop dead and not the king. Everybody wants that job, right? And the cupbearer. And these two guys have two different dreams, and it really troubles them. And they're down in the, their, Scripture says they're down in countenance. They're down cast in face. They look sad because they don't understand what these dreams are about. Now, i got to tell you, Joseph comes to them, and this is really, this is shows Joseph's integrity and his compassion. Because how many wardens do you know in a prison that notice when the prisoner's face are downcast? Right? So Joseph comes along and says, guys, why are you down? Why so sad? They said, well, we had these dreams, and they're really troublesome, and we don't know what they mean. And Joseph says, is God not the interpreter of all dreams? Tell me. God will tell me what they mean. I'll tell you. So they do. Well, not so good for the baker. In three days, he was going to be hanged. But for the cupbearer, on Pharaoh's birthday, is going to be restored back to his old position. And he was so thankful. The cupbearer was so thankful for, for Joseph interpreting the dreams. And Joseph said, well, could I ask a favor? Could you do me a favor? When you're alone, when you're, when you're about to take the warm, drink the warm milk before, you, before Pharaoh fades off to sleep, could you, could you tell him, I'm here, I'm innocent, I was put into prison on false claims, and could you tell him I would say, oh, yeah, sure, be glad to do that for you. You're thinking Joe's going to get out of prison. And then Scripture says in 40 and 23, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Forgotten for two years. Now, if you've been forgotten in your life, if you feel like everyone has forgotten you, I want to assure you that God has not. 
If the world has passed you by, God has not. God just has a different timing than the rest of the world has. He still has plans for you. He still has work for you to do. Even if everyone has forgotten you, God has not. But remember, God's timing is not your timing. In this story, Joseph is being educated, pruned, and groomed for a new position a position that will save the world from starvation. It's these very life experiences that are going to make him the perfect person for the job, just like your life experiences are making you the perfect person for God's plan. Amen? Remember, Jesus was guided by God the Father for a perfect time, the time for his birth, the time to start his ministry, the time to go to Jerusalem for his crucifixion, and the perfect time for his resurrection. If you think God has forgotten you, he has not. His timing just might be different than yours. Next is Joseph's rise to power. As most of you know to the story Joseph ends up second in power over Egypt. And through God's help, he runs the largest world food bank. And through divine providence, his family ends up coming to Egypt because they're starving, and he saves them also, and they begin to operate and live in Egypt with him. And I included this section not to encourage you that you will most likely be the second in power of any nation or that you will be as powerful as Jesus. But we're focusing on all the similarities between Joseph and Jesus, right? So that's why I have included this one. You can't help but note in all the chapters between 41 and 43 how many times the family bows down to Joseph. Remember those dreams? Yeah. And over and over again in the story, it keeps telling about how the brothers bowed down before Joseph. Paul tells us in Philippians, every knee will bow down before Jesus. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed him the name that is above every name. So that at the time of Jesus, so in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we know that Jesus has risen to sit at the right hand of God the Father after his resurrection. The next scene, the last scene, is Joseph's last requests. And I'd like to argue it should be our request. Finally, in the last chapter, chapter 50, which is at the end of the story, Joseph is on his deathbed. It appears that he's bouncing his grandchildren on his knees and he's telling stories. You, you remember your great, great, great grandpa. Remember, remember Abraham. Remember Isaac. Remember Jacob. Do you remember the stories about God, how they told him that one day we will return to the promised land. We'll return back to Canaan and we'll own all of it. It'll be ours, this place of milk and honey and wonderful paradise. We're going to return there. And I want you to swear something to me. Will you swear something to me? Oh, yes. Whatever you ask, Joseph, take my bones. Take my bones back to the promised land. When you leave, take me there. I, I, I want to be I want to be in that place. I want to be reunited with, with all the past, all those people that have gone on before me. I want my bones to rest there in the promised land that God has promised. 
I'm dreaming about my family, my clan, my nation coming into that paradise land, and I want my bones buried there with them. And this should be our attitude. I'm not only living for the here and now church. I'm living for what's coming. It's not just my responsibility to bring heaven to earth right now, but it's, it's my last request. It's my last request to live in the promised land. It's my greatest hope. Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 3, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where you are, I will be also. Joseph looks to the future, to the promised land. And Jesus calls us to do the same. Last week I lost one of my lifetime friends. And I gotta tell you, heaven's looking better and better all the time. So my last request is Jacob's last request. To live in that paradise place, to be in God's full presence, and to be with all those who've gone on before us. Let's pray and the sermon will be yours. Dear Heavenly Lord, we, we pray for everyone who is dealing with living in a hard family. We hope that they can overcome. Lord, if they're persecuted for your glory, lift them up, bless them. For those this morning who feel betrayed and hurt, give them strength. Remind them of Joseph's story and Christ's story. For those who are feeling forgotten, Lord, I pray that they might remember that your presence is with them and that you even remember, you even remember the birds when they fall from the sky. How could he ever forget you? Lord, give us patience to go through the rough times in life and deal with the false accusation, accusations that are made about us. Our last request, Lord, is that we be your children. Be with us now as we sing praise to you and we remember your son who gave himself for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the cross, Lord.